So we're in your United States history book, chapter 23, section four and part two. And we're going on to um, education during the time of the Roaring Twenties. And we got to economic determinism. Well, what is economic determinism? I think it's a very important word for us to know because it has to do with our educational system too. Because basically, um, in the 1920s, um, it came out to present our United States history and the history of, of the world in, in our public secular schools, and doing away with Christianity, doing away with um, any foundations that are absolute. But mainly, um, determin determinism is now on the economic, our economic um, level. So when you think of economic level, what do you think of? Money. So um, back when, when the Rockefellers actually changed our history book around, it made it look like if you had money, everything was fine. And that uh, economically, if your country was economically flourishing, it was good. And if, you, if everyone was wealthy, then things would go fine. Well, it's not always that the way it is with um, with the Lord and Christianity. In fact, Jesus wasn't very economically determined. We know that. So when you look at history and you look at for a, 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 through an economic viewpoint, you're going to get a different view of history than the the world view of Christianity. Your world view is going to be focused on materialism, money. The people that have more money are good, are doing good and they, they are civilized, right? And the people that have less money aren't. Well, that's not true when it comes to the Bible. So anyway, Charles A. Beard, he lived 1874 to 1948, and he began the claim that economic factors had on overriding influences upon men's decision and the course of history. So basically thinking, Economic factors is what we need to look at when we're looking at history. Economic determinism caused much distortion in the writing of history. Heroes of the past were abased or put down. In fact, there were no heroes. The heroes are the, those that were very wealthy, is what the, our history books told us. And so the noble deeds and things that were attributed um, only were attributed to materialistic motives rather motives of the heart. And so heroes um, of the past were not even mentioned um, in very much in our um, history books. So we didn't learn about them and we certainly did not learn about Christian heroes at all in our history um, in the secular schools. So here's a picture again of Charles A. Beard and economic determinism. Pragmatism. Very important, too, because this was put into our history books and it's put into um, history and the different accounts of worldview, whether it comes to socialism or communism. The end justifies the means. What does that mean? Is that what the way it turns out, if it turns out good, it doesn't matter how you get to that point. The philosophy that an idea or an action should be judged solely by its results regardless of moral or scriptural considerations and how you got there. You could lie, cheat, and kill. And as long as it turns out good and you get your means done, you get your ends done, and the means, you, you, kill just, you justify your killing, you justify your lying, you justify all these as long as it turns out okay, is not a, a, not good, a good philosophy to have. Well, William James, he lived 1842 to 1910, and he did the most to populize, populize pragmatism. Just remember, pragmatism means the end justifies the means. The pragmatic philosophy blots out the distinction between right and wrong and embraces the unscriptural concept that since all truth is relative, the end justifies the means. What does this mean? Relative means that, okay, um, we really don't have any absolutes. Sometimes, you know, lying is okay and good, and sometimes murder is okay and good, or whatever, you know. So on a, it's relative uh, on your culture, and it's relative on your, your personal way. 
um, that's the way I do it, or that's the way my people do it, instead of that's the way God would have us to do it. So um, uh, pragmatism is very much um, relative, and it also is um, very, very harsh in causing a lot of world wars and everything else where the end justifies the means. In communism, the end, they could kill 11 million or 15 million people as they did and say, okay, as long as we got to this, this new utopia communist government, it doesn't matter how many we have to kill. Hmm, that's pragmatism. So, and also pragmatism, John Dewey, who lived 1859 to 1952, um, bring the, these, the, the, philosophy of pragmatism, the end justifies the means, into our public schools. And then we're taught that, actually. So we're never told that it's wrong, you know, um, which, again, has to do with our secular um, secular uh, scholar scholarships, bringing, the, uh, bringing secular in through um, the Rockefeller um, and onto that, putting together our history books in making the end justifies the means being okay. Let's just say that. So let's go on from there. Progressive education. Progressive education has to do with pragmatism. It has to do with economic determinism, right? And it has to do with John Dewey. Have you ever heard of the Dewey Decimal System in the library? Well, he put that together, of course. But he also brought in um, this worldview, secular worldview, into our school systems. Um, and here he says, anyone who has begun to think places some portion of the world in jeopardy. In fact, hey, you know, he's thinking, well, now progressive education is when we just start really thinking about things. Well, progressive education, when we start thinking about things the way the world thinks about them, or do we think about things the way God would have us think about them, right? There's two different two different areas, you know. There's our, our spiritual concept and then the way the world thinks. But anyway, American education suffered from anti-Christian philosophies of the 1920s. Um, all of these philosophies came into our school, even down to later on we'll find evolution. But also um, liberalism, you know, on to... Um, positivism, all these isms, relativism, you know, onto modernism, pragmatism, all these things came into our school system. John Dewey, uh, he was the professor of the University of Chicago and also of Columbia University and both um, in, in Ohio, Columbia University in Ohio. And uh, he pull, applied humanism, humanism, basically thinking Human, humans are the center, that not God-centered, taking God out of education and applied humanism to education. So Americans now abandoned the teaching of absolutes and moral, especially moral absolutes. So now they took the Ten Commandments out. They took prayer out in the 1960s. These things were not allowed because they were not considered progressive education. And the world view changed basically to secular, to a secular world view. And it abandoned the passing knowledge onto the next generation. They basically were doing away with the old history of, of the old ways of doing, they said old ways, you know, um, but really when you think of old ways, they're not only old ways, but the new ways when they focused on the Bible, the Bible is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So it's old and it's new and it's in between. It has no time. But they would abandon uh, the passing the, the knowledge on to the next generation, saying basically we don't want the families teaching, um, teaching history, don't want the families teaching our education. We want the schools now. So let's not have um, the mothers and fathers passing on to the next generation. And the children um, now would... Be able to follow their animal instincts and their self-expression two things you know children were not disciplined as before and also they could ex express their self in expression without having to go into moral and absolute concepts and this is a, a turning away of traditional education altogether which was to train each 
individual to his or her abilities for the glory of God and edification for his fellow man. So that was what training was supposed to be in the Bible, is to train up your child to the glory of God, and he won't depart, depart from that, and to edify and love his fellow man. But that was not the teaching that was presented in the progressive education of our school system. Um, it had aimed, before it had it aimed at the, uh, of aimed at developing the ability, proving habits, and forming character of the individual so to prosper in a chosen vocation and to learn things to enrich life. So education was to enrich life in our vocations and to improve our abilities and improve our habits. Those are all important. And, the, and a progressive education is somewhat tried to keep that way, but without having any of uh, parental guides and having um, no education in the Bible or no um, focus on the glory of God at all. Dewey's philosophy emphasized the adjustment to the environment and control of the individual for the sake of society. That is the main difference. When you think, he said, basically, we want to make our society better. We want to be a commune, community, right? We want to live in community. That's more important than you or the individual. That You are not so important as the community is. Commune type, which is communism, right? So um, they emphasize the adjustment to the environment and control. So individuals needed to be controlled for the sake of society. That's socialism. Do we believe the purpose of education was education is the fundamental method of the social progress and reform. The adjustment of the individual activity on the basis of his social consciousness um, it's the only sure method of social reconstruction. So some words there. Education, what is it? He said it's social progress um, and reform of the society, not the individual, which is way, goes way, you know, uh, opposite from what the education was before. Education focused on the individual. Now education was focusing on the social progress of uh, the society and socialism and reform, reforming people to fit into the society and the adjustment on social consciousness, how they get along, social consciousness, how do they get along in their society, in their community, right? Instead of um, looking at the individual, the individual in their relationship with God, which is Christianity. You know, God loves each one. For God so loved the world, but he loves each one of us. He's no respecter of person. And as he focuses in on the ones, um, he come, comes alive. Those ones come alive with spirit and start loving each other by the spirit of God. See, there's no um, reaction of the Holy Spirit in Dewey's philosophies at all. In fact, Dewey was an atheist. Dewey rejected God and turned to a new social order of democratic socialism, he called it. He said, every teacher should realize the dignity of his calling, that he is a social servant set apart for the maintenance of a proper social order and securing the right of social growth. Everything is social, which means we are now... Um, we are now a socialism, social society, that we are focusing, the, the importance now is more on um, our community group, our um, ideolog ideological concept of worldview, whether not on the individual necessarily. In fact, the individuals need to conform to the social view. Hmm. That's a totally different than the Bible. Part spread of progressive education. Dewey taught his philosophies at the Teachers College of Columbia University. He 
He said teachers, school superintendents, and heads of other colleges would flock to learn from Dewey and adapt to his theories in American schools. So everyone needed to be um, controlled, when it controlled, controlled and taught. All the teachers needed to do it Dewey's way. So by the middle of the 20th century, Dewey's ideas had permeated much of the American educational system, resulting in a lack of academic learning and a lack of moral values among the students who were exposed to it. So the students were exposed not to the, the biblical standards or um, not to moral values necessarily. Everything was relative and everything would go, right? Everything's right in your own eyes. Just like the Bible and said in um, Judges, when they said the people at that time were away from, ran away from God and everything was right in their own eyes. And what was happening in our uh, school system? And this also resulted in the lack of academic learning as even test scores came down. As kids now, um, they didn't have to study or learn as they did before. They could do their own thing. Secular humanism now. Now we're kind of going into another area. Secular humanism, though, was in our educational system. But secular humanism uh, is a materialistic thought. And the, patterns, the thought patterns of the 19th, 20th century are totally interrelated into um, materialism and humanism. In recent years, uh, collectively, it was called secular humanism which secular humanism meant materialism and humanism all put into one. Secular, secularism is the belief that matters of morality should be based on the well-being of mankind in the present life to the exclusion of all considerations drawn from the belief in God or heaven or afterlife. So secularism says there's no heaven, there's no hell, right? And um, basically you need to live everything in this present life you know, that's secular, um, you know, eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow we're going to die. You know, let's not think about that. Let's not think about God. Let's not think about the afterlife. That's secularism. Now, that's when you put that together with humanism, where you're basically now you're worshiping yourself. You know, we all are little gods and we're all, we all worship ourselves, and we all worship human, human beings. Human beings are all you know, good, they're basically good human being, beings we know now are not. You know, the heart of man is deceitfully wicked. And that's why we needed Jesus to come and save us, right? So humanist uh, presuppositions, you know, brings in the mental conclusions of we need big government. The government needs to control everyone. Our society needs to control everyone. Self-centered, well, we're, we're going to focus on yourself, we're going to focus on you. You're, you're humanistically, um, you are, the, you are uh, um, the important one. Hmm. Well, uh, so, um, focus on yourself without being saved, thinking we need no Savior. He no God. That's humanism. Situation ethics. Man is an animal. There's no God, salvation, no eternity. All these things are the mental conclusion of humanist belief. Existentialism, another thing, just another offshoot of humanism. When you think of existentialism, you think of Kierkegaard. He's actually the father of existentialism. Although, when I was researching Soren Kierkegaard, towards the end, he um, basically re rejected the meaning of life, more like n nothingness, but he also um, was looking for a savior. I think probably at the end of his life, he came to the conclusion that he needed God in his life. So he may have got saved, but he was a mental wreck before that. So um, he is, Kierkegaard is considered the um, founder of existential. He lived 1813 to 1855. So this is way before the 1920s. But for some reason, they brought in existentialism again, you know, into um, liberalism and into our um, school system. And basically he said, our life is meaningless and he he's always fills us with despair, anxiety, hopelessness, and depression, and there is no escape. 
What a pessimist, right? For one thing, probably a, he, did, he was searching for God, right? I would say that, saying, oh, everything is terrible, and we have anxiety, we're hopeless, and, we're, and we, we might as well just live in our hopelessness. Hmm, not until you find Jesus Christ, and then you're free indeed, and he brings joy unspeakable and full of glory and a hope for eternity. But he didn't have that. He rejected the idea that science can provide meaning to our life either. Basically, he said everything. So when I look at Soren Kierkegaard, I was like, oh, poor Kai, you know, and then I looked on and I thought, you know what? I think he found the Lord, but nobody told anybody about it, you know? Um, but anyway, existentialism is the anti-philosophy which asserts there's no truth and there's no reality. So, and it began with the philosopher, the Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard, who I just explained. But the, the father of atheistic existentialism. See the difference? Because Kierkegaard was seeking for God, but Frederick Nietzsche, he's famous now, you know, just because atheists love to set him up as, oh, look how smart and great he was, this philosopher, Frederick Nietzsche. He lived 1844 to 1900, so he lived back in the um, 19th century too, before um, before the 1920s. And and he was, again, an atheist. I see this picture here because here he has this secret hand sign or whatever that just kind of is buggy to me, you know, like was, was he following the Illuminati or what? But anyway, um, but Nietzsche claimed that God was dead and we in society have killed him. So there, there's no God, you know. What a claim, you know. The Bible says um, that the fool has said that there's no God, you know. So anyone that says that there's no God, that God is dead, the Bible calls him a fool. So we can say, oh, that is foolish, you know. That is, that is, um, you know, ignorant or foolish. So he refused to accept that God exists as the creator and the sustainer of life and held the false idea that God is just imaginary and that man must make his own meaning by his actions. However irrational his actions may be, each man has to make their own meaning. Hmm. This atheistic existentialist became popular after World War I and in the 1950s, and even, even in my time and even in your time, people look, they'll say, have you um, read on um, Frederick Nietzsche? I would not want to read on someone who has such a foolish background that says that God is dead when God is alive today and living in us, you know. The rise of Darwinism. Okay, we, I did a whole video on uh, evolution Darwinism before in um, uh, the last, um, I think last year, and even in the beginning of this year. And we talked about um, Darwinism, and I believe that Darwinism, Darwin did come to the Lord at the end of his life. We have uh, evidence of that, of course. Um, the Darwinists and the evolutions would, would be never wanted that to come out, right? <laughs> And that he disagreed with his theory before he died, you know. Uh, that is not a thing that they want you to know, but he did. But anyway, um, the rise of Darwinism in education. Darwinism was the greatest assault on education because it was introduced um, to the public schools. You know, when I went to school, and here he had a picture of, you know, evolution. Everything was evolution. I remember going in, going in there and not believing in it and, you know, tell them I did not believe in it and they all made you look really stupid like, oh, she's one of those Christian fools. Of course, there's evidence. Now there's so much evidence against evolution. It's ridiculous, you know, so. But before the turn of the century, this false philosophy um, of Darwinism and evolution had little influence in the United States because most of America believed in the Bible and believed in God as a creator. And so they just thought, oh, you know, we don't want, evolution is foolish, you know, because a lot of America, knew, Americans knew the Bible account. And, but in the 1920s, now many um, these uh, people were praising Darwinism as the greatest intellectual discovery of the century. 
with no evidence. The theory of evolution had no evidence. In fact, it had false evidence. They even had it developed, you know, taking pieces of bones of pigs and making them into a missing piece and everything. There was a, there was a lot of corrupt and things going on in the midst of um, proving evolution was true. And some were eager to, eager to replace um, creation with the theory of evolution in the schools now. Let's put it in the schools and we're going to teach that evolution is the way, even though a theory that's, that now has been proven to be false. You know, even um, the science of the past has proven entropy that, um, and going on to the, um, the, the second law of thermodynamics that say things um, are going now from order to disorder. Things don't build up and make themselves into more advanced things. And now knowing the DNA code, how could a DNA, the complexity, complexity of the of DNA rise out of a, a, a piece of, of goo somewhere? And where did the goo come from? You know, it's just, there's so, so many holes, so many things that are totally backward when you, when you study in um, evolution. So now wanting to get this evolution into the schools, um, in response, some state and local governments, such as Tennessee, passed laws at this time in the 1920s forbidding the teaching of evolution in the school. They said, nah, we're not going to allow it in the schools. But then through the legal system, what happened? They had called a very famous trial in um, 1925 called the Scopes Monkey Trial. Just think of monkey, you think of evolution, right? I don't know why they call it, but they call it the Scopes monkey trial. So the supporters of evolution hoped to overturn the laws uh, prohibiting evolution in, in the schools. They said, okay, um, the laws are saying that public schools cannot teach evolution because it's, it's false. But now they wanted to go through this trial to bring in evolution. So they sought for a test case and they found a guy, a teacher, 1925, a schoolmaster right here named John T. Scopes. He lived in 1900 to 1970, and he agreed to cooperate with the ACLU, which is very socialistic, um, to challenge the Tennessee law that Tennessee schools needed to teach evolution. So the state of Tennessee versus John Thomas Scopes, and they just called it the Scopes Monkey Trial at that time. And the trial gained media exposure then. We had radio, and it was, so it was on the radio, and everyone was listening and interested, interested in, in how this um, trial would turn out. Um, partly because the, the famous candidate of, um, William, famous candidate, um, presidential candidate, William Jennings Bryan, um, was going to be the prosecutor. William Jennings Bryan was an ardent Christian, and he was the defender, and he was elderly at this time. In fact, after the Scopes Monkey trial, he actually uh, spent so much energy and anxiety on doing this that not too long after that he um, actually died. I think he had a, a stroke, or I can't remember exactly how, but not too long after did he pass away. Uh, and Scopes also had a celebrity attorney, a defense lawyer named Clarence Darrow. And um, he was well known of making soft sentences for heinous crimes. So he was a good defense lawyer, even to that point of, um, of being um, not totally, um, I should say, not, not totally truthful, maybe. Hmm. Well, anyway, so we have Clarence Darwin, famous um, for as a defense, and the famous um, Brian. Uh, William Jennings Bryan, who everyone knew about. So everyone listened to this trial. The trial really was on creationism versus Darwinism that was on trial. And the media personalities, the newspapers, you know, um, H.L. Mencken, um, um, and they berated Bryan and tried to make him in the news portray him as a Christian fool and that, that Christians were foolish. They tried to put Christianity down. Brian and Darrow each made eloquent arguments, mostly exploring the merits of creationism and Darwinism rather than the actual question of the law. 
and Brian emphasized the question of evolution um, concerning theology and philosophy rather than science. And so they all ridiculed Brian as being unscientific when he testified. Darrell then played on emotions and mocked Christians more than even de defending his client. And uh, Brian actually then won the case. So John T. Scopes was found guilty, and at this time, evolution was not allowed into the Tennessee school system. But Darrell's arguments were aided by the media and said that he had success, successfully portrayed um, Brian as a dotering religious idiot and that Christians were put down as idiots. Hmm. So basically, it was a mocking trial. And many Americans feared to oppose evolution were concerned that they would be looked down at as bigots and ignoramuses, because that's what Darrell called Christians, bigots and ignoramuses. And I take that even into account now. How dare he call me as a Christian who loves Jesus Christ with all my heart a bigot and ignoramus? And don't they do that still? That's what they call, that's what they would call Jesus, you know? And so this trial, although it came through as a, um, as a win, because at this time um, evolution wasn't allowed in, but later on it would be allowed in as it was and is now. It wasn't my time. So that's it for now. And so we'll have one more video and we're going to go into the video of what um, happened during this time in the Christian um, evangelism, which is, was magnificent. So on the positive side of things.